I am completely delighted to, um, <laughs> to welcome, all the way from Italy half the time, Shan Geisinger. 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 Um, who is going to talk to us about something that I, uh, many of you who know me have heard me harangue you about this, this topic, so I'm totally delighted to have you come and introduce it, if briefly. Oh, well, I am so thrilled to be here and so grateful to Laura. I think I would have uh, killed myself um, a, a while ago if it hadn't been for Laura and some other parents who got what I was trying to say and told me how helpful it had been. Um, although I'm going to diverge with Laura right away and say that um, you asked us not to use um, anorexia, bulimia, and BED, but to use eating disorders instead. And I noticed that a lot of people, most of us couldn't resist using the specific diagnoses. And that's because we're cleaving nature at her joints, as the great um, systemist uh, Carl Linnaeus uh, tried to do. There's a natural, um, a biological, uh, profound differences we're finding uh, as we look in brain imaging and we look at uh, neuroendocrinology of eating disorders between anorexia, bulimia, and BED. And um, it's true that people do move back and forth, but I'm going to give you an explanation for why that happens. Um, we, as you probably know, we existed for 200,000 years as Homo sapiens. And before that, for five million years, we were kind of working up to it and making a living as omnivorous, opportunistic, wandering foragers. Um, we were very, very effective hunters. Uh, but what that meant is that when humans moved into an area, uh, they often as hunting as a group, they could take down things like mammoths. And we were responsible for 37 genera of large megafauna going extinct when humans made it over the Bering Sea land bridge into the New World. Uh, so what this ex uh, successful hunting meant is that there would be population booms and then crashes. There were times when humans almost winked out. We were down to 50 individuals. And when, when, if you were a, a hunter-gatherer uh, and you were starving, what that meant is that there, were, you, there was no food there because hunter-gatherers shared food. They were egalitarian. One person starving, everyone starving. Nowadays, you could be starving in many places in the world because you're poor. But for most of our evolutionary history, it meant there's no food there. When people... Hunter-gatherers were starving. Most of them just hunkered down and tried to wait for, you know, spring to come back for migration of animals or, you know, you, starving people typically move as little as possible. They focus on just one thing, and that's finding food. But some people, you probably have noticed this if you've ever lost weight, you notice that sometimes people, in fact, feel a bunch of energy, and they... Uh, wanna, they're more energetic and they're not hungry. And what we know about people with anorexia is that they come from high, um, highly conscientious people with high self-control. So if there were some people in the, in the band who had the ability to control their appetite and to, had the energy to search, they could be sent as advanced scouts provisioned with what little food they, the, a uh, band had left, maybe, and sent out to look for food. Probably most of them died, just as most of the people who went searching for better lands and a tiny fraction ended up in Hawaii. Most of those people died, right? I mean, it's impossible for people to move from Ho Polynesia to Hawaii without most of them not making it. But in evolution, it only matters if you make it, <laughs> one person makes it. And we're all here because some people made it. Um, okay, so what does it take to be able to search for food when you're starving? It takes the ability to stop feeding locally because when food is restricted, 
I mean, when food is um, rare, when there's famine, searching for food takes all day, and you don't get anywhere. Mo hundreds of animals stop feeding when they need to migrate. That's a traditional thing, or, or common thing. Um, and if, um, an another interesting thing I, I should say is that um, the tribe probably sent their teenage girls out to look. So we know now that teenage girls, 14 years old, 18 years old, are two modal periods, and that 90% are, are of anorexics are female. And the reason for that isn't that females care more about their body size for their self-esteem. It's because ovarian hormones at puberty turn on the heritability of anorexia nervosa. It's not, it's time we stop shaming people <laughs> uh, for something, I mean, women have been blamed their personality flaws for anorexia since it was first described uh, back in the um, 19th century and at that time attributed to hysteria. Okay, so there were bottlenecks. Are you almost out of time? Well, no, you, Laura. You, um, the, the, we can, you can talk longer or we can do more questions. It's, that's, that's our choice. Mind if I talk longer? <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so you, I'm sure you understand the idea of a bottleneck in, in genetics, that if you happen to be the one who carried these genes that made you tend to overestimate your, your, res, your fat resources, move actively, and um, be able to stop feeding, then you would be, you could be among the few founders of a new population that then exploded. So now your genes are overrepresented in the new population. We know that when humans were moving out over, out of Africa, over the globe, this happened again and again and again and again. Population bottlenecks and then population explosions. Um, so one of the, I presented this data in 2003 in Psychology's Best Theory Journal. It was highly peer-reviewed, and it showed that the adapted to flee famine hypothesis had far more, explained far more of, the, of what is known about anorexia than any other theory, any other explanation. And I thought, okay, my job is done. I'm a clinician, I'm not an, an academic. I did this because I found it helped people get better, and I started my career as an evolutionary biologist, so after thinking about it for 10 years, I came to this and, and published it and thought I was done. Well, Laura noticed it. Some other people noticed it. No one in the U.S. did. I'm, going to, I'm doing research in Italy because in Italy, I'm working with an anorexia treatment center that has found this useful in their program. Um, I think that Europeans are a little more open to evolutionary explanations, perhaps. I, I'm mystified about why it's been so difficult to, but you know, we have a hard time thinking about understanding really that our consciousness, which we attribute all of our behaviors to, is actually not choosing most of what we do. Most of what we do is chosen by the adaptive unconscious. And way, uh, homeostasis, energy homeostasis, is controlled by neuroendocrine mechanisms. That's why we all gain the weight back that we lost dieting. And that's why it's so remarkable what people with anorexia are doing. You can't do this without all these genetic changes. So what are some of them? Um, what we're finding since my article was published in 2003, we now have functional magnetic resonance imaging research that shows that the insula that's responsible for assessing the uh, distress, uh, the of, or assessing whether or not you're star hungry, um, is blunted, it's, high, it's underactivated when someone is asked to imagine drinking chocolate milk when they have anorexia. Meanwhile, the right amygdala, the part that's responsible for conditioned fear, and the dorsal striatum involved in habitual behavior are overactivated. And so people feel terror. Um, you've probably heard something like this. I know that if I continue like this, I will die, but eating is even more terrifying. And you prob some of you probably know that it was only since 1960 that people regularly attributed their 
behaviors to fear of getting fat. So what we do when we humans in, uh, is that consciousness is something sort of plopped on, onto us very late in evolution, but it takes credit for everything we do. And so um, our consciousness is very uncomfortable with the answer, I don't know, and so it makes up a story in the context of the time. I want to tell you just one story about uh, a client. I was so, I was jumping up and down with joy <laughs> when uh, this woman told me this, this thing, and maybe some of you have heard this. Um, dreaming is one of the ways that uh, we can put instinctual behavior into our brains. Uh, all animals spend most of their time dreaming before they're born. And we actually, so she, in her dream, she had recurring dreams as she was developing anorexia. She's eating, she's gonna eat some ice cream and she's hungry, she wants it. And she's eating the ice cream, or not eating it actually, she's pushing it around in her bowl and kind of wanting to bring it up to the spoon to her mouth. But her, it's an anxiety dream. Her anxiety is getting greater and greater and she's being filled with more and more dread. And she pushes it around, pushes it around, brings it up, and then lets the ice cream fall off, puts down the spoon, deciding not to eat, and she's filled with the most perfect peace. I would love to hear if anybody else has had this kind of a dream. But that's how that, that conditioned fear got wired into the amygdala. Okay, I want to say something about funding. We've got just a little more time. Okay, 30 just, seconds. just want to say that it's hard to want to spend money on something that people have done to themselves, right? People with obesity, people with binge eating disorder, people with uh, bulimia, and people with anorexia are with us today because they saved their ans our descendants. <laughs> they lived because they made it. And in fact, I believe that no one in this room would be here without those people in our past. That people with eating disorders and obesity are heroes, are the descendants of heroes who, who I don't think Northern Europeans for sure would be around without those people in our population in the past. And if we could think about this as uh, adaptations that made sense once, it also helps people to take charge of their own illness. There was a question about what does weight have to do with it? Weight has everything to do with it. This is what weight is, we, we've known for a while now, like 20 years, that um, <laughs> anorexia is turned on by weight loss and it's turned off by weight gain and it's leptin that does it. And you can give, administer leptin to rats, which also develop, which like us were op opportunistic omnivorous foragers, and pigs, and they all spontaneously develop the exact same syndrome. And if you give them leptin, it reverses it. With humans, because we're maybe more conscious, it reverses the hyperactivity, but it doesn't reverse that conditioned fear. But it is and these are ancient adaptations to famine. And if we could bring that, that feeling, <laughs> that realization, I believe we'd get the money we need. And we'd also be able to ask better research questions. So thank you all very much. If you're interested in uh, knowing more, I have a website called Adapted to Famine. And there's a, 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 a workshop for clinicians uh, on the PESI um, website. Uh, thank you. Thank you.